Hi there, everyone. Welcome back. It's Lars Hammer, the pastor at Lord of Grace Lutheran Church here in Marana, Arizona. Welcome back to the Walk Through the Psalms, a little Bible study where I look at passages of the Psalms. Uh, not every Psalm and not every passage, but uh, ones that seem to stick out, uh, ones that I feel speak uh, right now at this time. So uh, today we're going to keep going on Psalm 51. We're going to look at verses 15, 16, and 17. So uh, here we go. Let's read through these. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. There is so much good stuff in this one. Uh, I love it. So, here we are again with the sacrifice. We're just going to have to back up a little bit again. This whole sacrifice issue, uh, it, it's huge. It's huge in the Bible. In the Old Testament, you have a, sort of one school of thought that values sacrifice, particularly animal sacrifice, very highly. Then you've got another school of thought that is very critical of animal sacrifices. And generally, uh, it's the first five books the known as the law, those come down real heavily on animal sacrifice. Yes, you should do it. Here is how. This is the techniques. You know, this is how one gets right with God when one has sinned. One makes an animal sacrifice. If I have stolen something, I need to make an animal sacrifice. If I uh, did something impure, I go and make an animal sacrifice. After I do that, I am right with God. And the idea, while it kind of grosses us out, the idea of priests, you know, tying animals up on this big altar with ropes and taking out the knife and feels kind of weird to us, the idea behind it in an agrarian world is that you're not just coming to God and saying, you know, God, I'm sorry for what I did. I feel bad. We can all tell, we all know stories of people who've said that a million times. Oh, I'm so sorry, I feel so bad. Oh, I'm so sorry, I feel so bad. And then they do it and do it again. And you're just like, well, look, if you feel so bad, why do you keep doing it? Change your behavior, right? Show me you're sorry. So then the cliche, of course, is, you know, the cheating husband gets busted. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And she says, I don't believe you. And then he goes down to the, the jewelry store and comes back with this gigantic uh, rock. And the idea is, you know, again, we'll kind of laugh at it. And yes, it is kind of like bribing her not to leave. But the idea is you're putting your money where your mouth is, in essence. And sacrifice works a little bit like that. The idea is you're not just saying, God, I'm sorry for what I did, but you're actually putting your money, in this case, uh, livestock, which was super valuable in an agrarian economy, and you're deliberately killing it without getting to eat it or getting to tan the hide of it or use it at all. You're essentially, you're completely losing it. You know, and I'm sure a rancher today could probably be the closest to relating to this, right? You've got your cattle out there. If you had to just get rid of it, not sell it, not trade it, just completely get rid of it, that's lost money, right? That's a lot of money. And so the animal sacrifice system had its purpose, it had its place. But what ended up happening with the sacrifice system was that it became a way, especially for people who are rich, to avoid any real personal lifestyle change when they had done something wrong. So, for example, uh, if you were a wealthy landowner and you had servants or slaves, unfortunately they had slaves, uh, and you uh, mistreated them in some way, you know, you, you beat your household help and, um, you know, somebody said, look, you're abusing, you're abusing the help. What you've done is wrong. And then the rich guy would go, oh, no, you caught me. I'm so sorry. And because he's got tons and tons and tons of cattle, he goes and he grabs one and walks up to the priest uh, at the temple and goes, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, here's my uh, here's my cow. Here's the bull. Right. So they sacrifice the bull and the priest says, all right, you're forgiven. And uh, then the guy goes home and does it again. Or for the prophets, the issue with the sacrifice would be that 
that they don't address the socioeconomic issues. How did the landlord get to be so rich? And you know, was he enslaving people in the first place? That's an injustice. Is he taking people and turning them into slaves uh, through debt slavery? Right? Is he taking debtors and instead of forgiving their debt saying, you gotta work it off by being my slave for the next 20 years? Is he enslaving people that way? Is he robbing people by fixing weights? Is he bribing judges? All these kind of things the prophets would get mad at and they would, they would ream out, usually the rich and the powerful, who would then say, oh, oopsie prophet, you got me. And then they'd go and grab some more livestock and run to the priest and then go back to doing it. And the prophet's like, I, I don't care how many bulls you slaughter anymore. More. I need you to stop enslaving people and, and bribing judges, etc., etc. I need to see some change in your behavior and some change in the system before I'll listen to this sacrifice thing. It became a way to get away with it. Sort of a, almost like a, not a get out of jail free card, a get out of personal change free card. So this is the, the sacrifice thing that's coming in. Now what's interesting is Psalm 51 is believed to have been written by King David. And King David himself, according to 1 Samuel, uh, was big into animal sacrifices. He went and when David took the city of Jerusalem, uh, it wasn't always a Jewish city, it used to be a Canaanite city, David took the city, conquered it, and moved the, moved the Ark of the Covenant there uh, so that he could have God's holy place in his new capital city. As a thanksgiving to God, he slaughtered God knows how many bulls. A whole ranch full of cattle died. So David himself had done animal sacrifices. But again, as the richest guy around, that wasn't necessarily something that would change his heart. And it wasn't a sacrifice that was really a sacrifice, right? It's sort of like when a billionaire gets a parking ticket and has to pay 250 bucks. Oopsie, and writes a ticket and just walks away and doesn't care, right? It's not really a sacrifice. He could pay for a thousand parking tickets and it still wouldn't be a sacrifice. So David had, at one point in his life, felt that God was in his, on his side, that he was in God's presence, that he was doing the right thing, that he was offering, making this big sacrificial offering to God uh, uh, to thank him for giving him victory and thank him for giving him this new city, uh, for all the things he had done. And so he thought this was good. And now here along, David comes and he gets busted for doing what? going off and sleeping with another guy's wife, killing her husband, getting her pregnant, and then trying to marry her quick so it looked like he was the father. And again, the prophet Nathan called him out on this. And so David gets busted, and where we are here in Psalm 51 is David is starting, he's gotten to the point where he says, all right, now I'm going to rethink what this means. And I'm not just going to go run out to the, to the ranch and grab a whole bunch of cattle and go, all right, God, you know, here's 50 bulls. Are we good? He does, in fact, he takes the opposite way. He has the opposite way. Verse 16, for you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. You would not be pleased. So David understands that what God is wanting here is something deeper than just unloading some livestock. He says, the sacrifice, in verse 17, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken spirit, and then poetically he reiterates it again, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So the real sacrifice is not just even a changed heart, but a broken, a broken one, right? A, 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 a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. That's an interesting phrase. It caught me again while I was looking through this because usually the rhetoric you hear in Christianity is a changed heart, right? I need a changed heart. But, what's, but here in Psalm 51, David isn't even getting to the point of talking about a changed heart. First, he has to talk about getting a broken and contrite heart. So 
I, I know a lot of times people will say, I've changed. We'll go, back to, we'll go back to the guy who cheats on his wife. We'll use that example, right? He gets busted and says, hey baby, hey baby, I'm a changed man. Okay, so you say you're a changed man. But he doesn't look all that sad about it. He just says he's changed. Like, like it was a switch, right? And you could just take the knob and you could go from, uh, uh, you know, I'm, an, I'm a philanderer to, oh, now I'm a changed man and I, I'm a good upright citizen. Like you could just go like that and flip a knob. And what David is implying is that the part of himself that was getting involved in this, the sinful, power-abusing self that got him into this trouble in the first place, it needs to get broken. It needs to get broken down first. That the process of repentance is deeper and more involved than just making a declaration of change. That there has to be a process of breaking down so God can build back up. Uh, and I, I, really, I really liked that when I looked at that. I found it very powerful because how often do we just want to jump straight to the change without going through the painful process of breaking down what were the things that got us there in the first place? Because often those parts of ourselves that get there in the first place, we aren't necessarily sure we want to give up those. Maybe we want to give up the end product, right? You know, okay, I, I got mad and I went smashing things, right? Okay. Babe, I'm going to give up the smashing things. Well, that's a good start, but what is it in, inside of you? What is it a part of you that got you to the point where you were raging in, in the first place? What made you so angry and hateful and, and mean that you started running around smashing things? We got to get to that, and we got to acknowledge that. We got to break that down. So the process of you changing is going to be more uncomfortable, more lengthy, more difficult than simply saying, hey, babe, I changed. And you're going to have to get broken down. And nobody wants to get broken down. And David, again, who should have been, as king, the proudest person, comes to God and he acknowledges, God, I get it. Me giving you cattle is not what you're looking for right now. And you're not even just looking for me to say, all right, I'm not going to do it again. You're looking for me to do a deeper examination and break down that heart of mine. If the heart is angry and hateful or spiteful or sinful or, uh, you know, in the case of David, power abusing and stealing and lustful, it, that stuff needs to get broken down. And when that stuff is broken down, now God can rebuild it. Right? Verse 17, let's read that again. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. You will not despise, O God, a broken and contrite heart. So that is what will get me your favor. I get it, right? He's saying this partly to God, but he's saying this because I think he wants everybody else who's reading this or going to hear it sung to know that I, David, am sharing with you this truth. And this truth is that if you, to get back into God's favor, you have to basically break down your prideful self and let God rebuild you. And that can be tough, right? Okay, let's finish out the Psalm 51 here. And let's just add the last two verses, 18 and 19. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Okay. So we started out with, you don't want sacrifices, and then it's, but now you do. Okay, what is it? Well, I think what David is saying here is, the sacrifice of the bulls has not been voided. God still wants you to put your money where your mouth is. But that is not a substitute for acknowledging what you've done. That the bull only is acceptable to God if first you have done the work of repentance. When you've done that, then God will accept your sacrifice. So the full process of coming clean 
you know, you have to admit, is, is involving admitting what you're doing, of, of opening yourself up, of asking God to uh, change you, asking God to give you a new spirit, a new heart. You're then asking God to help break down the old heart, to replace it with the new. And after you've done that, after, after all that's done, then, then, we can, then we can put our money where our mouths are. So the personal change, put your money where your mouth is, then one is restored. So it's, it's not a quick, easy process. But making yourself better and coming to terms with, you, you know, the dark sides of ourselves, our own hates, our angers, our fears, our, our selfishness, you know, there isn't an easy way through that. And I would say the same thing probably applies with most any relationship you're in, is that when there's big wounds, there isn't a quick and easy way to heal them, that, that, and to honestly heal them. It's going to involve a lot of breaking down the heart, a lot of, a, a, a lot of listening to the pain that's been done, which will break down your pride like you can't imagine, and then asking God to restore you, and then putting your money where your mouth is in some way to uh, show through your actions that you're willing to put the work in and change it, and then it will. And so what is David looking for? Well, he's a king, so he's always got a political angle. So that's why in verse 18 he says, do good to Zion, that Zion is Jerusalem, in your good pleasure, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Right, re re rebuild it, rebuild the city. So this is what he's hoping for, right? I've changed my heart. All right, God, now, you know, I, I get it. So please, let still heal the city and then we'll, we will have cleaned up our act and then we'll offer the bulls because then I know you'll, you'll take it. All right, so there we go. That's how Psalm 52 rounds out. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful prayer for repentance. A wonderful, almost like a manual, you know, to turn to, uh, to reflect the honesty that's, and the hard work that's needed to really come clean and get that clean and right spirit with God. All right, thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time. God bless.